Father, help us now that our hearts might be open to your word and the movement of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On December the 16th, 1944, Adolf Hitler launched a massive surprise attack on the Allied forces in Ardennes region of France. That day, 250,000 Nazi troops caught the Allies by surprise. Unfortunately for the Allies, that group they attacked was about 80,000 inexperienced soldiers. And in no time, the Nazis had broken through. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. And if you don't know about the Battle of the Bulge, you need to go home and read your history. But the Battle of the Bulge had begun. And the Battle of the Bulge is regarded as one of the most brutal battles in American history. In, the, in that very short battle, the Allies lost 90,000 troops and 20,000 American soldiers lay dead in a matter of days. That's when the Supreme Allied Commander, General Dwight Eisenhower, called up General George Patton. Patton was a true warrior. In fact, his nickname was Old Blood and Guts because Patton was known for his grit and his courage. And although Patton's army wasn't close at range, uh, they figured Patton could do something to save this massacre that was taking place. Uh, in, in, in an unbelievable, brilliant military strategy, somehow General Patton was able to mobilize the Third Army and break through the Nazi ranks within seven days. Patton hit them with such an incredible attack, such a barrage, and he was supported by some other troops that, listen, the Germans could not recover, and within three months, the Nazis had surrendered, and their participation in World War II had come to an end. Patton went on to become a legend, and in fact, any, pretty much any list of the greatest American generals you will ever see, General Patton is ranked as one of the top ten. In fact, many say he's the second greatest American general ever. But you know, Patton is such a great general. Books have been written, movies have been made about Patton. But the real unsung hero is Patton's mom. Because when George Patton was a little boy, he suffered from a very severe learning disability. And as a result of this disability, he had great difficulty learning to read, write, or spell. Today we have found out that what he had is, was dyslexia. And we have found ways to deal with it. But back in the 1890s, when George Patton was a little boy, there was absolutely no one who knew what to do. So anyone who was born with dyslexia back then was almost guaranteed to be a failure. But Patton's mother, Ruth, was not going to allow that. And Patton's mother stuck with him and encouraged him and pushed him. And so when he got, by the time he was 11 years old, Patton had started to learn how to read and write. Patton, as he, uh, later on in his life, George Patton realized that it was because of his mother that he had become this American legend. And he would often tell his colleagues that were it not for my mom, I would not be the success I am today. And after, he di after she died, Patton wrote his mom a letter. Uh, and he said, dear mama, you're still very near. He says, my only regret is that during your life, I didn't take more time to tell you how much I love you. And to tell you how much I admire your courage. He was a great man. But he had missed one of life's great opportunities. And I'm going to suggest to you, my friend, that if your mom is still alive, that today and every single day, you take time to let your mom know how special she is. Might I tell you, it will mean more to her than you ever think. Take time to tell mom that she is special. I'm so glad to have had a great mom. 
Moms are so special. Without them, we wouldn't be here. But you see, moms mean more than just giving us birth. They nurture us, they encourage us. They, a good mom, sadly, not everybody's going to say the same about their mom. But listen, even if your natural birth mom was not special, trust, I trust that there's somebody in your life that was like a mom to you. Who mothered you, nurtured you, encouraged you. Moms know just how to, to pick you up when you fall down and bruise the knee and kiss the knee. And somehow that kiss has healing properties. <laughs> Moms are so special that some people call their mom an angel. Some people call their mother a saint. President Richard Nixon, he always said his mom was a saint. But you know, Nixon left the White House in disgrace. So mom, if your son or daughter calls you a saint, probably you can't fully depend as to whether that's so or not. But listen, there is somebody whose word you can depend on. And if God says you're a saint, you're a saint. And as I was thinking about what I would share with you this morning, the Lord laid me to an unusual message for Mother's Day. I want to talk to you about what a real saint looks like. You say, how does that have to do with Mother's Day? Can you imagine how it would revolutionize our homes and our families? Mom, can you imagine Mama? If your children decided today to become a saint and to behave like a saint, can you imagine what would happen at home? Can you imagine if you're if the fathers, the, the men in the home, can you imagine if they decided to behave like saints? Mom, can you imagine if you decided to be a saint? No, I'm not talking, I'm, this is not pie in the sky, because here's the good news. Every single person here this morning can leave here knowing for sure you're a saint. I, I want you to understand that. You say, Pastor, you don't know my background. I don't need to know your background. God knows your background, and he's the one saying you can. Every single person can leave here a saint. So you say, some of you are sitting here and you're saying, well, this message is not for me because I'm one already. But I'm going to also talk about the fact we need to behave like a saint. Oh, come on now. We, we, God wants us not only to leave here this morning being sure we are saints, but he wants every person who is already a believer in Jesus Christ to make a commitment to behave like a saint because he wants to change some families. And this would be the best Mother's Day ever if everybody here said, God, I'm willing to look like one. Mother Teresa of Calcutta is one of the most well-known Catholic nuns. You know, she never had children of her own, uh, but she raised thousands of children who had been abandoned and discarded. Some were abandoned because of AIDS, some were abandoned because of tuberculosis and other things, uh, but for whatever reason, these children were abandoned, and Mother Teresa took them into her home. Thank God for people, mothers like that. And I'm so glad to know that in our church, there are some who have adopted children, who have done, uh, acted as foster parents for children. They weren't your children, but you took them in and you mothered them. Hallelujah. Thank God for you. Amen. Amen. Mother Teresa died in 1997. And nine years later, the Catholic Church canonized her and made her a saint. You see, the Catholic Church believes that to be a saint, you have to be dead. Number two, you have to have lived an exemplary life. And number three, uh, you must have been involved in at least two miracles. But let me ask you, is that what a saint really looks like? Do you have to be dead? I don't want to be a dead saint. <laughs> but as Paul begins the letter to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 1, look with, it there, with me uh, there. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
by the will of God to the to the saints who are in Jesus are in Ephesus hallelujah these people were saints these people were living breathing people they were fully alive hallelujah they were fully alive but Paul says they were saints this morning I want to share with you very quickly three facts about God's saints three facts about God's saints number one God's saints all have a sinful history God's saints all have a sinful history some of you may be surprised to hear that because in your mind a saint was somebody who was almost perfect they did little or no wrong uh, you could almost see the halo over their head in fact in your mind a saint is somebody so special that there is no way you could be a saint my friend you got it wrong because to be honest none of us would make it if it has to be that special uh, but look at what look at the history Paul call, tells us that these people in Ephesus were saints but look at what he talks tells us about them in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 he says here's it here's what Paul says about these saints he says you God has made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins these people were dead folks in sin he says you are so into your sin he says you used to walk according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the ear that term the prince of the power of the ear is a term the bible used to describe the devil this paul says you used to just follow the devil around you see ephesus was a place where they were so much into idol worship it was the center of worship I told you last week it was the center of worship uh, for the goddess Artemis or Diana the leading goddess at that time and even worship was sinful even worship was erotic because worship included hundreds of religious prostitutes you can use your imagination worship was sinful but not only were they into all sorts of stuff, this place was steeped in witchcraft. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But they were big into witchcraft. And yet, Paul calls them saints. Why? Because God had transformed them. God had turned these sinners into saints. And my friend, the good news is the God who turned the Ephesian sinners into saints is willing to do the same for us this morning. Amen? The problem is sometimes we don't want to believe we're sinners. I never remember, I'll never forget the first time I went to jail that is a prisoner hallelujah <laughs> although I did pay a brief visit to prison as a prisoner arrested falsely for messing with a police he said I assaulted him well that's another story for another time I just rested my hand on the poor man's shoulder to try and reason with him. The next thing he says, you have arrested a police officer. And off I was locked in jail. Uh, you see, you've got me to start to the story. <laughs> I don't know where that came into my mind from. I said, I'm allowed a, a phone call. He said, not in this jail. <laughs> That's good old Jamaican justice. He says, I'm going on a mission, and when I come back, I'm going to beat you like how thugs like you should be beaten. That time I'm dressed all in my tie and everything. <laughs> but that's another day. <laughs> You'll hear the end of that story somewhere along the line. But here I am, I had no experience, I'm going to prison ministry, and, and I go in, and I said to the first guy I saw, I said, how was your day? <laughs> he said, 
He said, you don't seem to understand where I am. He didn't say that. But his face said, I'm in jail, fool. <laughs> so I asked him my next more penetrating question. So I said, what are you here for? He said, murder. I said, By the way, that's a true story. I was so blown away because I thought that they weren't going to let us into with the murderers. But he was there as a murderer. And he, then he said, but I'm not guilty. <laughs> well, he probably was like me. But do you know what I found out after a while? Almost every time I went to prison ministry and asked the guy, he said he wasn't guilty. There is something about us that doesn't want to accept the fact that we're guilty. And there's some of you here this morning who don't want to come to the grips with the reality that you are a sinner. You say, after I'm not so bad. <laughs> I'm not as bad as that other dude. I'm pretty good. God. To be honest, if God gets me, he's a lucky guy. But here's what my Bible says. In Romans chapter 3 verse 23, the Bible says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my friend, I just want you to get this. Whether you're male, female, young or old, you need to recognize that God says you are a sinner. He says every single person who has put foot on planet earth are sinners you are a sinner i am a sinner and my friend god wants you to admit this morning that you are a sinner will you do that you see until you are willing to admit you are a sinner there is absolutely no possibility that you can be a saint because in luke's gospel chapter 5 verse 32 here's what jesus said he said i have not come to call the righteous i have come to call sinners to repentance did you hear what jesus is saying jesus is saying he only came for sinners the message of the gospel is only for a sinner and unless you are willing to say god i'm a sinner there is no salvation possible but this morning i'm praying and we are praying that if you're here this morning and you have never come to jesus and said lord save me it is our prayer that this morning will be your morning when you'll open your heart and your life and say lord jesus come into my heart and save me god's saints all have a sinful history but secondly god's saints have all been transformed by the gospel we're going to put up a verse that we read in Sunday school this morning and it confirmed what God wants some of the things God wants me to talk about this morning but 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 we'll put it on the screen for you and it says anyone who belongs to Christ has become what a new person the old life is gone a new life has begun you know I believe there's somebody here this morning that if you were honest and you reflected on your past, you'd say, boy, I wish I could get a brand new start. And God is offering you a brand new start. Despite what you have done, despite how many people you have hurt, God is willing to give you a brand new start. He said if any person is in Christ, they have become a brand new person. The old life is gone and new life has begun. Listen, God's saints have all been transformed by the gospel. Let me share with you two ways in which this gospel transforms a life. Number one, salvation begins when we believe the gospel. Salvation begins when we believe the gospel. Look with me here at Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 12. Here's what it says. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory, in whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Listen, listen to what it is saying. It is saying that these Ephesians, how did they become saints? Don't miss this, folks. These folks became saints because they trusted after they heard the word of truth, which is the gospel. They said, after you heard the gospel, you trusted. It says, in whom having believed. These people believed the gospel. 
I run into people all the time who believe the reason they're going to heaven is because they're good church members. I'll ask them, I'll ask them, have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? I said, are you sure you're on the way to heaven? Perhaps you're here this morning and you, 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 you're not sure how you'd answer. And do you know what people say? They say, Brian, I'm a member of Heaven Bound Baptist. And all of us in Heaven Bound Baptist are Heaven Bound. I've been baptized. I, I am in the usher board. I'm a trustee. My friend, you could be baptized upside down, right side up, sideways. All I want you to know is when you're baptized, if you have never trusted Jesus, you went into the water a dry sinner and you came up a wet sinner. <laughs> Nothing happened. You see, these people were saved because, listen, they believed the gospel. Well, the word believing the gospel, you, I may, you may say to me, what is this gospel? For in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're not going to turn there, but the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 15 gives us in a nutshell what the gospel is. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that here are some key essentials of the gospel. Christ died for our what? Sins. All of us are sinners. But thank God Jesus Christ died for our sin. That's the good news. Jesus died. He paid the penalty that my sin deserved and your sin deserved. Aren't you glad that Jesus died for your sins? But listen, he was buried, it says. And then it said, on the third day he rose again. That's hallelujah ground because if Jesus it was still, listen, if Jesus didn't die, rise from the dead, if Jesus was still in the tomb, his death would be like anybody else's death but Jesus Christ. And by the way, in case some of you wonder, is this for true? Listen, this is the most well authenticated fact in ancient history. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has been authenticated not just by the Bible but all sort of secular historians. Jesus Christ's resurrection is fact and authenticated and the fact that my Jesus is alive gives authority to the fact that he's able to save and to keep all those who come unto God by him hallelujah listen that's the gospel Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And listen, what God wants you to do is to believe. Yes, admit that you're a sinner, but believe that Jesus died for your sin and that he is able to save you. This business of belief, though, gives some people trouble because you might say, but pastor, I believe. I believe Jesus was here. I believe he was a good man. I believe he died. In fact, I believe he died for me. But you see, believe i'm glad this verse actually adds the word trust because the belief that jesus is talking about the belief that saves is a belief that causes you to trust your life to god the killer wave volcano is big in the news this week because it has been erupting and it has been destroying homes and, and this week of course I couldn't help but remember, and some of you heard me tell the story before, but I couldn't help remember uh, the, when Cheryl and I went to the Kilauea volcano several years ago. And uh, when we got there, the, there was a big, the gate was closed and there was a big sign, a danger, keep out, volcanic eruption. And so all those people who wanted to see the volcano were turning uh, back. And, but your, you know, you're, this brother sometimes he's a little stubborn-headed. So I pulled over anyhow, and I walked up to the gate. And there were some rangers there. And, and, and the ranger said, you know, you've got to keep out. And I said, is it possible for us to go in? <laughs> I, and for whatever reason, I, I, I sometimes wonder why. I, I don't know why. Probably because he hadn't run into too many Jamaicans there before. But for whatever reason, he said, would you like to come in then? I said, is it dangerous? He said, yes. But he said, 
if you follow me, you'll be okay. So I looked at my wife, and you know, she sometimes will go along with me. <laughs> and so we decided we're going to go through. We went through the gate, just the two of us and the guide, nobody else, everybody else was turned away. Was it that we were fools? <laughs> but we were trusting. I, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. I tell you, it was a long way. But as we got closer to where the, the earth had broken open, it got fiery, hot. When I say hot, and the smell of sulfur, and there were like little pieces of glass because of where the, 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 the lava would flow into the, into the ocean with all that uh, the silica in, in, the, in, the, in the thing. But I tell you, we finally got to a point where he said, listen, you don't make any step. Wherever you see me step, you step right there. And to make the point, he, he broke off a twig and he touched a stone that looked like a regular stone. And when he touched the stone, it just lit a fire. He wanted us to realize that even some of those stones that looked like they were, they were so hot because an eruption, that section was a, you see, it wasn't one of these bow eruptions. It was a gentle, nice, sweet eruption. <laughs> but as we walked by behind the guide, it became clear we were trusting him with our life. What an amazing thing to, to look inside. Cheryl and I still sometimes talk about it. To look inside the earth and see the fire. The literal burning fire. Oh, you don't believe there could be a hill? God already has, he's got something under there right now. The literal fire. And we look inside. Of course, we're like burning to death because it is so hot. But I wonder if you realize what happened. We had totally entrusted our life in that man's hand. We never made one step. Can Brother Herb, trust me. I never made one step. And God is asking some of you this morning to put your trust in him. Not just with your life. He wants you to put your trust, entrust your life, your soul to him. He wants you to say, God, I am so trusting that you will lead me to a heavenly home, that here is my life, and I'm going to go your way. I'm going to follow you, and I'm not going to take any steps that you're not taking. I'm going to go with you all the way. Where he leads me, I will follow. And there needs to be somebody here this morning who will say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to go. I'm willing to admit I'm a sinner. But I want you to save me today. But listen. Salvation happens when we believe the gospel, but consecration only happens when we live out the gospel. The word saint comes from a Greek word which means consecrated to God or to be set apart for God or to be holy that's what it means it's to be consecrated to be set apart for God and the minute you and I put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ something dramatic happens God actually consecrates us he sets us apart for himself and that's why it's possible my friend for you to become a saint today because if you trust Christ he will set you apart for himself he will make you a saint but there's another aspect you see God has set you apart but what he wants you to do is to set yourself apart In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, we read these words. It tells us we're not only saints. It says we are called to be saints. Well, I want you to get the difference. We are saints the minute we trust Jesus, but we are now being told we are called to be saints. What God is saying is that those whom Jesus has consecrated ought to behave like saints, not ain'ts. There are a lot of Christians who are behaving like ain'ts, like they ain't Christian. And those whom God has consecrated ought to live a consecrated life. The 
this is what he says to here in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 8 for you were once darkness if you're there say amen Ephesians 1 verse chapter 5 verse 8 are you there amen for you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord hallelujah my beloved brother and sister he's telling us a fact you were once in darkness, but you're now in the light. And he says, walk. This is an imperative. Walk as children of light. A saint has no business acting like he ain't. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the fruitful unfruitful works of darkness these these folks in Ephesus got it do you know that these they were so these Christians were so big into witchcraft but after they became Christians the Ephesians realized we can't live like this anymore so guess what they did church had a big bonfire elders probably we need a bonfire gca the elders had a big bonfire and they brought the people brought all the books on witchcraft all the book on the magical arts oh we need a bonfire for all you folks who have some pornography in your house all the videos all the magazines we need a bonfire that you can come and burn the trash do you know the bible actually took the time to tell us that the value of the books they burnt was 50 acts 19 you can read it for yourself when you get home 50 thousand pieces of silver was the value of the books you say bring it into today's term i i did some calculation based on some some, some things that i found online five million dollars worth of books they burned can you hear me five million dollars worth of books because they were convinced we cannot keep on living the same old way get this get this people who want to keep their garden beautiful cannot preserve a plot for weeds Did you get that? People who want to keep their garden beautiful cannot preserve a plot for weeds. How stupid would it be for you to be growing all these flowers and right in the front of the flowers is this big plot of weeds that you have specially preserved how in the world do you think if you don't do it in the natural why in the world come on no Christian friend why in the world are you doing it in the spiritual why in the world have you preserved a plot for weeds a plot for stuff that you know doesn't please God as if God don't see come on as if God don't see this morning God is talking to somebody and he's saying the plot has got to go the weeds has got to go that old way has got to go you got to walk my way because you are a saint and if you're a saint you ought to look like a saint this is a special family day in our Sunday school class, we spoke about relationships. And I am convinced that one of the big areas of challenge for believers in Jesus Christ, in addition to the C 
sinful, clearly sinful stuff we do. Here's another big issue. That's as sinful as all get out, but we love to excuse it. We love to keep a plot where we refuse to forgive. We have issues with people. In fact, I bet you if we took a survey, there's a good number of you here this morning who have an issue with somebody. Oh, you're a believer. Do you know that some people have no intention of calling their mom today on it's Mother's Day? Did you know that? Cut it mad. Do you know that their mothers and fathers who haven't spoken to their children in a while because they're mad? And yet you say, but now I belong to Jesus. And all I know is Jesus has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God is in the business of reconciling us to himself and to reconciling us to each other. And my friend, I just want to say to you, whatever your issue is, whatever your plot of weeds is, God is fingering it right now. He's touching it. He's telling you right now. He's saying to you, that plot of weeds in your life has got to go. I trust that this morning, as we give the invitation in a few minutes, you will speak to God and say, God, I'm willing to go your way. I don't only want not satisfied just to be a saint. I want to act like a saint. I want to behave like a saint. Listen, God's saints all have a sinful history. God's saints all have been transformed by the gospel. But finally, God's saints all have the Holy Spirit's guarantee. Did you notice when we were reading Ephesians chapter 1, it says here in verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The minute you believe you were sealed, there's nothing you had to do to be sealed. Listen, the minute you got saved, the Spirit of God came in you. And the Bible says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Listen. The minute we got saved, the Spirit came into us and He did two incredible things for us. Number one, He sealed us. And number two, He guaranteed us. Number one, uh, the, the first thing the seal means, the seal means our salvation is complete. Listen, there's so much more we could talk about the seal. But one of the things it means is our salvation is complete. We don't have to go trying to speak in tongues. We don't have to wait for nothing. We don't have to tarry. The minute you receive Christ, your salvation is complete. But the second thing it means, we are secure. I remember I used to receive all these envelopes and it would have a wax seal. Anybody ever got one of them? It had a wax seal on it. And when you got that wax seal envelope, you knew that the contents inside uh, the, the envelope had been secured. And God secures us. He seals us to let us know. Listen, listen, listen. The minute you become a saint, you can never become not a saint. Amen. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Not even the devil in hell can pull us out of God's kingdom. Not even the devil in hell can make me not a saint. Hallelujah. But the Holy Spirit, he guarantees our inheritance. Thank God we have an inheritance. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to put it on the screen for you. Verse 3 and 4, it says, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Do you have any great expectations this morning? We live with great expectations and we have a precious inheritance uh, thank God an inheritance that is kept uh, in heaven for you thank God it's not down here he has it reserved in heaven for me it's pure it's undefiled it's beyond the reach of change and decay one day we'll talk more about that inheritance but that's not that's not today's message but hallelujah the best is still ahead for the child of God So what does 
a saint look like? A saint is a person who had a sinful history but has been transformed by the gospel and in whom the Holy Spirit lives. Does the Spirit of God live in you? You say, Pastor, I'm not really sure he does. If you are not sure he does, perhaps he doesn't live in you. Because my Bible tells me that the Spirit of God witnesses with my spirit and he gives me that deep assurance in my soul that I'm a child of God. And if you don't have a deep assurance in your soul, if you don't have the witness of the Spirit telling you, don't, you don't have to worry because you are saved, you are a saint already. If you're not sure, you need to make sure this morning. You need to come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you as my Savior. And he'll save you. You leave here, wow, I'm a saint. The story is told of a judge. He was running late for court. And by the time he got to court, the court was packed with all these people who needed to hear, the, have their cases heard. And judge decided, you know what, I'm to speed things up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make things very easy today. What I'm going to do, I'm going to form two lines. I'm going to have a guilty line and an innocent line. All those of you who are willing to admit you're guilty, come and join the guilty line. And all those of you who think you're innocent, join the innocent line. So guess what happened? Three little stragglers came to the guilty line. All oh, the long line of innocent folk. Three little. The judge sat on the bench and he said to the folks in the guilt line, all of you who have admitted you are guilty, I declare you innocent. You're free to go. He says, all of you in the innocent line, I'll sit here till night if it takes to hear your case oh that's just a story but what a powerful illustration because that's what God is offering you today he says if you'll come and say I'm guilty I want your salvation he's willing to declare you innocent he is willing to declare you a saint do you want it can you believe it's that simple you don't have to get beaten in your back you don't have to go up a flight of stairs on your knees all it takes is a decision in your heart where you say, Lord Jesus, come into my life today. Father, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and we pray, God, that in the quietness of this moment, your spirit might work on someone's heart. They will say, Lord Jesus, you've been talking to me today. I am willing to admit I'm a sinner and I want, I am trusting in you.